right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a few things at the top. Uh, first of all, we want to welcome all the young people, yourselves included, uh, who are working with their parents today at the Pentagon as part of our annual Take a Child to Work Day. It's estimated that we have uh, somewhere near 10,000 young guests here today, and it's been exciting to have their energy and their voices echoing in the corridors of the Pentagon. I'm pretty sure I've seen a few kids with light up shoes that make them run faster, so I've reached out to the Defense Innovation Unit to talk about that. Uh, looking ahead to tomorrow, Secretary Austin will convene the 21st Ukraine Defense Contact Group meeting here virtually. The meeting will commemorate the two year anniversary of the first contact group following Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Over the past two years, the contact group has shown its unity and resolve as evidenced by the continuing support and donations made by our international partners and allies. Additionally, the contact group continues its work with Ukraine to help it move towards development of a robust, efficient, and self-reliant defense industry. We'll have additional updates to provide following tomorrow's meeting. Switching gears to Africa, as you've seen, the U.S. State Department announced U.S. Ambassador to Niger Kathleen Fitzgibbon and Major General Kenneth Ekman, U.S. Africa Command Director of Strategy, Engagement, and Programs, will meet with the National Council for Safeguarding the Homeland uh, officials today in Yemi, Niger, to initiate discussions on an orderly and safe withdrawal of U.S. forces from Niger. Subsequently, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict Christopher Mayer and Lieutenant General Dagvin Anderson, Joint Staff Director for Joint Force Development, will conduct follow-up meetings uh, in Niamey next week to coordinate the withdrawal process in a transparent manner and with mutual respect. We'll be sure, of course, to keep you updated regarding any significant developments. In the meantime, the Department of Defense remains committed to countering violent extremist organizations in West Africa. The department will continue to support whole of government approaches to work with African leaders to maintain stability and address terrorist threats in the region, including addressing core issues that drive insecurity. Separately, as an update for our humanitarian assistance support operations to establish the maritime corridor off the coast of Gaza, I can confirm that U.S. military vessels, to include the USNS Benavidez, have begun to construct the initial stages of the temporary pier and causeway at sea. We're aware of the significant interest in this important effort and will provide much more information in the very near future as we work alongside the international community to rush aid to the people of Gaza. And finally, uh, Friday will be the last day in the Pentagon for Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Sasha Baker. We want to thank her for her superb leadership within the Department of Defense and for her service to our nation. On behalf of the Secretary of Defense, we wish her all the best in her future endeavors. And as we previously announced, Ms. Amanda Dory, a, civil, a career civil servant who currently serves as the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies at National Defense University, mm -hmm. will perform the duties of acting Under Secretary of Defense for Policy when Under Secretary Baker departs. With that, I'll be glad to take your questions. We'll go to Tara AP. Thanks, General Ryder. Um, back to AFRICOM. So it's almost 8 o'clock now in Niamey. Have you gotten any uh, readouts on how those initial meetings went? And uh, would this mean <coughs> the complete total departure of all U.S. forces, or are some of those terms still be being negotiated? Yeah, I, I don't have a readout to provide. Of course, again, uh, we'll keep you updated. Uh, as, as things progress here. Um, and in, in terms of uh, the withdrawal of, of U.S. forces, again, I'm um, really not able to go beyond what I've provided right now, uh, which is that they will begin discussing the orderly withdrawal of, of U.S. forces. So uh, what that pertains in terms of timelines, numbers, again, we'll keep you updated. But is the assumption that it will be that all U.S. forces will go, or is, are there, is there still room? I think that's uh, a safe bet is the going in assumption. Okay, and then on Chad, um, similarly, <coughs> have our U.S. forces withdrawing from Chad, and is this all of the U.S. forces there, um, approximately 100 or so, and, and why? Um, so, as I understand it, as talks continue with uh, Chadian officials, U.S. AFRICOM is currently planning to reposition some U.S. military forces from Chad, a portion of which were already scheduled to depart. Uh, this is a temporary step as part of an ongoing review of our security cooperation, which will resume after Chad's May 6 presidential election. So again, we'll uh, keep you updated. I would refer you to 
State Department to discuss, you know, the, the diplomatic sides of this, um, but that's where we stand right now. Warren. Uh, a follow-up on Niger and then a different question on, on Gaza and J-Lots. Uh, the withdrawal appears maybe not imminent, but at least fairly imminent. Niger was a critical base for AFRICOM ISR and monitoring violent extremist organizations. Does the Pentagon have a location to move those forces? A and if so, is that location ready? Or, or are those forces for now coming back to the United States and, and there is no alternative to Niger? Yeah, well, as, as I highlighted, I mean, first of all, we are committed to countering VEOs in West Africa. Uh, and as you know, we do maintain a robust network of partners, uh, and we will continue to consider all options when it comes to accomplishing our, our CT mission. Um, you know, the bottom line is that we will continue to monitor threats uh, throughout the Sahel in order to protect our personnel, our assets, uh, and our interests, as well as the welfare of our partners. So we're going to continue to explore options, uh, understanding that, that this is an important uh, national security interest and a vital mission. How much is the CT mission set back without something like a Niger to stand to, ready to go? Well, you know, certainly uh, when you look at the size of Africa and you when you look at the threats, uh, you know, the preference would be able to have uh, the ability to operate out of places like Niger. Um, but of course, we have other means and methods uh, that we can do that. So um, all that to say, again, we understand the, the importance of the CT mission uh, and we will explore options to ensure that we can continue to do that, albeit maybe perhaps through other means and methods, but importantly, working in close partnership with African partners in the region. And then a very quick j -Lots question. A few mortar rounds landed near the pier site. Has that changed the timeline for construction there? And has it compelled the U.S. to consider a different pier site or different defensive measures associated with the construction of the pier? Yeah, the, the incident uh, in no way delays our efforts to establish the maritime corridor. Go to Liz. Along those lines, uh, any sense when the corridor will be up and running? You talked about the first week of May. Yeah, so all indications right now, Tom, are that uh, we're on track. Uh, I think, you know, earlier I'd said uh, probably looking at end of April, early May. I think uh, indications now are realistically early May, um, but everything is on course at this point. So I'll keep you posted. Liz, did you have a question? Uh, my question was asked and answered. Okay. All right. All right, let me go to the phones here. Uh, Tony Capasio, Bloomberg. Hi, Pat. Quick question. When do you think the first uh, munitions for Ukraine will arrive? And will they be the 155 shells or some of the other equipment that's been, that has been prepositioned in Europe? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, as, a, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I won't get into the specifics in terms of when specific uh, you know, ammunition or equipment is getting into Ukraine other than to say uh, we're moving out already. Uh, we've already started the process to move some of the, the weapons, ammunition and equipment, uh, which will be, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there within days, uh, if not sooner. Uh, and so, uh, again, recognizing there's a, a variety uh, of equipment and capabilities on the list that we put out. Um, some of those things will obviously take longer than others. Uh, but when it comes to uh, essential capabilities uh, like ammunition, um, you know, we're, we're already moving out to, to make those deliveries. But again, for OPSEC, I just can't get into specific timelines uh, or routes, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Uh, let me go to Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to follow up with the question about the incident with the, the pier. What exactly happened? Did, uh, did Hamas fire... Uh, rockets or mortars at the pier while it was under construction? And if so, was anything damaged? Was anyone hurt? Yeah. So to clarify, uh, so kind of two different things here, Jeff. So first of all, when it comes to the temporary pier and the, and the causeway, those are being constructed offshore out at sea and, and are, you know, essentially nowhere near mortar range. So that that's not what we're talking about here. Um, you know, we're, we're aware of reports that a small number of mortars uh, landed in the vicinity of the marshalling yard area uh, for humanitarian assistance that will eventually be uh, the delivery site that, that this pier will support. Uh, and it's important also to highlight that this occurred before any U.S. forces, uh, you know, have started moving anything. Uh, there will be no U.S. forces on the ground. Uh, and, and as I understand it, in terms of, uh, you know, there, there is no U.S. equipment per se in this marshalling yard. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously I'd refer you to the IDF for, for more granular details, uh, but that's where things stand right now. Fadi. Technically speaking, um, doesn't the pier 
lead to the to the shore? Isn't it connected to the shore to to yeah. help? So kind of kind of think of this in four different parts. And again, you know, we're we're going to get you much more information here. But so you've got Cyprus, and then you've got Gaza, right? So Cyprus is where aid will be stockpiled and loaded onto ships. Uh, Gaza is the shore where eventually this temporary causeway will connect. So what we're talking about here is the Marshall the Yard, uh, where eventually uh, in the vicinity of where this causeway will connect to, but the, the two essential pieces in the middle are the temporary pier, uh, which is out at sea, and then the causeway, which eventually will uh, join land uh, and be anchored, so to speak. So, And then on a separate uh, issue, um, probably you've seen the reports about the mass graves that are being discovered in Gaza with hundreds of bodies being digged out uh, daily. Has the secretary raised this issue with his Israeli counterpart? And does he think um, these mass graves uh, warrant uh, an independent investigation? Yeah, thanks, Fadi. Uh, well, you know, to, to uh, say first off, I mean, the, the reports are very disturbing. Um, to my knowledge, the secretary has not spoken to uh, his counterpart about this. Um, but, you know, I know that, uh, as Mr. Sullivan highlighted yesterday, the U.S. government has raised this uh, with the Israelis uh, at multiple levels. I don't have anything to provide from a Defense Department standpoint other than uh, we do believe that, that these reports must be thoroughly investigated and, and taken a look at. So, leave there. Sir. <clears throat> Thanks, General. Um, so my question is on the additional military advisors that the Pentagon has said it plans to deploy to Ukraine. Um, some have voiced the concern that this is at least in part what preceded the war in Vietnam, where we sent you know, military advisors continually adding to the list that was there, and then some would you know, be killed in action. Um, what do you think of that escalation risk, the fact that U.S. servicemen are on the ground there in Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, I appreciate the question, but I, I think you'd have to probably have a deeper discussion on the history of the, the Vietnam War and, and what we were talking about there, which is a completely different thing, right? You don't have U.S. forces conducting training inside Ukraine of um, indigenous forces. So to compare the two, you know, unfortunately shows kind of a, a lack of understanding in terms of what we're talking about here, apples and oranges. What's going on in Ukraine, and as we've done for a while, is we have a small presence working out of the embassy, out of the Office of Defense Cooperation. Uh, and those small number of advisors are providing, uh, you know, information and advising on things like support logistics, uh, weapon oversight program, helping with the uh, ensuring that um, there's end use monitoring in place, you know, that we've talked about in the past. Uh, first of all, and to, and to clarify, uh, the addition of additional advisors is something that has is being considered. No decision has been made. Um, but if that decision is made, uh, a couple of key points. First of all, it'd be a small number. Uh, second of all, those folks would be working out of the embassy under the chief of mission authority, like the rest of the embassy, and would be subject to the same travel restrictions as all embassy employees. So, yeah. Well, uh, point taken on the differences, and there are there were far more in Vietnam, but I, I guess, do you recognize the concern is legitimate at all that there are U.S. servicemen in the in this country that is an active battlefield so that you know if there's an errant missile that kills one it could lead to a dangerous escalation well look you know i mean again um it's not unusual for the u.s military to work out of embassies around the world in many different countries as part of our security cooperation efforts and to help coordinate security assistance um, but but it, critically these forces are not in a combat role, they're in a non-combat role, they're in an advisory role, and again, we're talking very small numbers. And the Uni United States has no intent of conducting combat operations inside of Ukraine, nor are these forces going to be uh, anywhere near the front lines. And then the other piece of it is, uh, you know, to your point about danger, you know, of course we recognize the danger, and any place our forces operate, we take the necessary precautions to ensure that they're, that they're safe, uh, whether it be there or any other hotspots around the world. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. My question is on TikTok. It's a lot of going on as far as the U.S. national security threat is concerned because of the, it's a part of owned by the Ch Chinese Communist Party in China. So why is it taking so long to ban the, uh, when everybody knows that this is a national security threat because India had banned already over two years ago because of the national security threat in India. 
So over 170 million, I was told, users are there in the US. So that means China have already this much information from these people by the Chinese Communist Party. So uh, are anybody using in the department, uh, DOD or Pentagon? And uh, where do we stand now as far as national security threat is concerned? Yeah, appreciate the question, Guilfoyle. So a um, couple things. So first of all, it already is Department of Defense policy uh, that we will not use TikTok on any U.S. government devices. So that already is a policy that's in place. I think what you're asking is, is the broader question about banning of TikTok uh, writ large as it relates to, you know, throughout uh, the U.S. And again, that's a question that's beyond the scope of, of my small little place here at the, the DOD. So thank you. Yes, sir. Um, uh, regarding to Rafah, um, did you receive from your Israeli counterpart any plan about their um, military operation there? And with your assessment, what do you expect the Palestinian uh, to go out of Rafah? What we are seeing right now that the IDF, like uh, leaving some parts and re-entering again to the same parts, and they are still bombing everywhere. So. As, as a DOD, what do you expect these people should go? Yeah, so as it relates to, to Rafa and operations in Rafa, I'd, I'd refer you to the IDF to talk about the specifics in terms of what they are and, and aren't doing. From a U.S. standpoint, from a DOD standpoint, we've been very clear uh, that uh, while we both agree uh, that the defeat of Hamas is, is important, uh, that any operations uh, going after Hamas in Rafa take into account civilian safety and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. So the, as I understand it, the Israelis have shared uh, some of their thinking in terms of, of what a Rafa operation could look like, uh, but those conversations are still ongoing as we still have concerns uh, about how they would go about doing that and taking into account the large number of displaced people and their safety. So uh, I know that uh, at the highest levels, uh, Israeli uh, officials and, and U.S. officials will continue having those conversations. Um, but again, our, you know, our focus here is on ensuring not only can Hamas be defeated, but that the safety of those impacted by this conflict is taken into account. So. Thanks, General. Um, just turning to the Red Sea, uh, there's been a drop in Houthi attacks. <coughs> I don't think there's any for a couple of weeks. I believe there may have been some yesterday. Um, what do you attribute that drop uh, in Houthi attacks to, and what do you make of the resumption uh, yesterday? Oh, well, you know, again, in terms of the, the Houthi mindset, in terms of why they opted to not uh, conduct attacks for a couple of weeks, that, that's really something best left for them to address. I would say that regardless, our focus hasn't shifted, which is working with our international partners to ensure the freedom of navigation through the Red Sea. Uh, and so as long as there continues to be a threat uh, to international shipping and to the, the lives and safety of mariners transiting uh, the Red Sea, we'll continue to work with international partners to degrade and disrupt Houthi capability. Are there back channel talks going on? With the, with uh, I, don't have any, I don't have anything to talk to on that time. On, um, on you, going back to Ukraine, how confident is the Pentagon that um, the Ukrainian military can m make up for what's being widely portrayed as a lost six months, uh, you know, while Congress was dithering, uh, you know, a lot of Russia made a lot of advances. Are you confident that um, uh, Zelensky and, and, and the military are going to be able to make up for that time? Well, look, it's a, a tough situation right now in Ukraine. It's a tough fight. Um, but I think uh, anybody who tries to count the Ukrainians out obviously has not been watching what's happened over the last couple of years. Uh, and so uh, as Secretary has, as Austin has said, uh, you know, Ukraine matters. What happens in Ukraine from a security standpoint uh, impacts not only Ukraine, but European security and international security. So we're going to continue to support them, uh, not only to defend the territory uh, that they've defended from Russian occupation, but also to take back their sovereign territory. And we're going to do that for the long haul. All right. Yes, Liz. Thanks. Um, going back to the humanitarian pier in Gaza, um, just to clarify, you said that the pier itself the U.S. is going to build or is building is out of the range of the mortar fire, but what about the causeway? Well, again, what I'm saying right now, so there was a, a, this mortar uh, a, a attack uh, today on shore, 
right? So what I said is that uh, initial construction has begun of the causeway and the temporary pier at sea. So they're, they're not constructing that anywhere near the shore at this point in time, if that makes sense. And you said there were no damage to any U.S. assets. Um, were any Israeli assets damaged? I'd have to refer you to the Israelis on that. Sir. Thank you, General. Uh, two questions. And uh, one is uh, my colleague already asked here two days ago. Uh, U.S. and South <coughs> Korean uh, having the uh, discussion on the uh, sharing the cost of American troops in South Korea. I think they finished the talking, so do you have any readout <laughs> on that discussion? And also, uh, why uh, you guys having this discussion at this time? Um, I appreciate the question. I don't have anything in front of me. Let me take that question and we'll get back to you. Okay. And also, uh, on China, actually, this is uh, Secretary Blinken is on the trip to China right now and expected to uh, give a warning to the Chinese side, not commercially, supposedly building the Russian defense industries. Uh, from point of view, uh, do you have any specific uh, concerning areas of the coordination uh, between Russia and China? Um, you know, I won't get ahead of Secretary Blinken and, and anything that he may be putting out, as you've heard us say, and as, as you heard the president recently say, uh, we are concerned about some of China's activities as it relates to supporting uh, Russia's defense industry. Uh, and again, essentially, uh, by doing so, enabling them to uh, conduct or to develop capabilities that are being employed against Ukraine uh, in their occupation of Ukraine. So, yes, sir, then I'll come back to you. Uh, thank you, General. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, the United Nations uh, representative to Syria says, Syria has become a focal conflict zone among superpowers for their interests. So how do you see the situation in Syria now? Well, look, uh, I mean, Syria has obviously had some significant challenges going all the way back to, um, you know, 2011, which, you know, I know you're very familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, you have a significant area of ungoverned space in Syria, which has allowed groups like ISIS uh, in the past to essentially exploit that uh, and use it toward uh, sowing instability, uh, death and destruction throughout the region. Uh, and so... From a U.S. military standpoint, obviously our focus right now when it comes to uh, Syria is focused on working with as part of the international coalition for the enduring defeat of ISIS. And so that remains our focus. Um, but I think, of course, you know, more broadly speaking, um, when you see these types of ungoverned uh, spaces, they, of course, present threats regionally. And so that's something that we obviously consult uh, not only with our partners in Iraq, uh, but also allies like Turkey and, and others uh, to address those regional threats. So one more question on Syria. Uh, as the RD, do you expect any Turkish uh, ground incursion into Syria as Turkey claims? Uh, I would have to refer you to Turkey on, on anything that they're doing. Thanks. Laura? Um, so just on the pier and the attacks on the marshalling area, to, be, to clarify, were you confirming the attacks themselves, or just originally you said you were aware of the reports and then later you spoke as if you were confirming the report? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that we're tracking some type of uh, mortar attack causing minimal damage um, in the vicinity of the marsh marshalling yard area. Damage. Yeah, minimal, minimal so there was damage. minimal damage. Yeah, in terms of what specifically was damaged, I'd have to refer you to the idea. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, let me just take one more, Heather, from USNI. Uh, thanks so much. So uh, just on the Red Sea, uh, the Houthis attacked uh, the mayor's Yorktown. Uh, I was wondering if we can get more information on uh, which coalition ship uh, protected that, sh uh, shot down the, the anti-ship uh, ballistic missile. And then um, the Houthis were, said that they were also targeting a U.S. destroyer. And I was wondering if there's any information on whether or not uh, an a destroyer was attacked today or yesterday. Yeah, thanks, Heather. On your first question, uh, the only thing I can provide on that was that it was a, a coalition vessel. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll allow our, our partners to speak for themselves in terms of uh, what action they took. And then I'm sorry, your second question. Uh, the Houthis claimed that they were attacking a U.S. destroyer. And I was wondering if you've had any reports of a U.S. destroyer being targeted either yesterday or today. Uh, I at, at the moment, I'm not aware of that. Uh, you know, as you know, CENTCOM puts out... Um, updates every day, but uh, I'm not currently uh, tracking a U.S. destroyer being uh, attacked. 
Uh, but again, if we have updates, we'll, we'll put those out through CENTCOM. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.